Welcome to John's Tours. Today, I want to show you the exterior of St. George's Hall, Liverpool. Some say that this building is the greatest neoclassical building in the whole of Europe. The area itself is frequently filmed as the backdrop of many films. And this started a long time ago when the Lumiere brothers, the pioneers of moving pictures, produced a short sequence of films at the turn of the century. Recent films, such as The War of the Worlds, showed St. George's as being part of London. In the film Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, St. George's was New York. Other films, such as Creed, a Sylvester Stallone film about boxing, had St. George's decorated in Everton blue. Nowhere Boy, a story of John Lennon's youth, was also filmed here. It is, of course, Birmingham for the Peaky Blinders series. And the show had Grace walking up the steps to see Major Campbell. And inside we see the attempt to murder of Thomas Shelby. The area was once called the Great Heath. An area that must have closely represented Bidston Heath today. Bidston Heath is a rocky barren area full of gorse and heather. And because of its height, wheel mills were established. And later on, lime kilns, a seamen's hospital, a medical library, a lunatic asylum, and in 1789, the town's first infirmary opened with 30 beds in a place called Shaw's Brow, later to become William Brown Street. In the early 1830s, an improvement notice was served to demolish the buildings around the area, and in the meantime, the land was used for travelling fairs. Once every three years, musical festivals were held in Liverpool, and their popularity outgrew the venues. Mayor Curry, in 1836, held a public meeting to consider erecting a building to accommodate festivals. It was decided that a hall should be built. The hall would be called St George's, but the committee had no idea on what the hall would look like. And by 1836, over £25,000 had been raised. In 1839, the St George's Committee placed an advertisement announcing a competition to design a concert hall. There are 80 entrants, and a young architect of 25 years of age called Harvey Lonsdale Elms won the competition. It was his first commission. Liverpool was also in the county of Lancashire, but the nearest assize court was in Lancaster over a 70-mile journey. In 1835, the government decided that Liverpool should have its own assize court, and a committee was selected to oversee the project. And that committee, the Liverpool Assize Committee, proposed to put their development of the Assize Court on the Great Heath, and they too announced a competition for its build. Incredibly, the young Harvey Lonsdale Elms won the competition, beating more than 80 applicants. Harvey Lonsdale Elms decided that he wished to put forward a new design to incorporate both requirements of a concert hall and of an Assize Court and this was approved of by the corporation. By 1841, the corporation took over the responsibility of the combined building to build an iconic building that would rival, if not be better, than anywhere else in the world. The building itself was built for £300,000, a considerable amount of money in those days, and the hall was being built at the same time as the Albert Dock in itself a considerable feat and achievement. Let's look at the exterior building, but before we do, let us try and put our minds, our senses, our prevailing thoughts into the minds of this Liverpool Victorian boomtown. This Liverpool, called by many the second city of the empire, and my apologies to Birmingham and Glasgow and anyone else who ascribed to this name, Liverpool, with its trading links across the world, and in particular America, was seen by many people as the main port of the British Empire. Some statisticians say that Liverpool dealt with 40% of all the imports and exports that came into Britain. Liverpool, with the success of the railways, its shipbuilding and mercantile trade, the leaders of mid-19th century Liverpool decided to create a town that would consciously copy London, Edinburgh, and those other great cities of Rome and Athens. 
In the 18th and early 19th century, the gentlemen of Britain would undertake a period of foreign travel. And this was called the Grand Tour, allegedly to finish off their education. The gentlemen went in search of Western civilization to Italy and Greece. Some of the Liverpool architects of the time, John Foster Jr., Charles Cockrell, were all enthralled by the ancient architecture of Greece and Rome. Now these tours normally lasted a year. Cockrell's lasted over seven years. Elms decided that his creation, St. George's Hall, would be a fitting monument to the classical architecture of Greece and Rome. We will start from the south end and in front of us is a row of 10 Corinthian columns. And we can see in Latin, which I'll translate, says for the arts, law and council, the townspeople built this place in 1841. We will turn right in an anti-clockwise direction and we take in the whole of St. George's Plateau. The plateau itself has been associated with many great gatherings of joy, celebration, sorrow, mourning and protest. In the middle is our cenotaph. A competition was organised and the winner was Mr. Lionel Bailey Budden. The cenotaph consists of a rectangular block of Stancliffe stone running parallel to St. George's. The cenotaph was unveiled in 1930 on Armistice Day. Along each side are bronze relief panels over 31 foot long on each side by Henry Tyson Smith. The panel facing St. George's Hall depicts an army barely shown as a block on the move, while the panel on the Lime Street side shows mourners of all ages, including Smith, his wife and son. And they are dressed in everyday dress, laying flowers and wreaths on a stone of remembrance with rows of graves in a military cemetery behind them. You can also see the city's official coat of arms on the end of the cenotaph. In 2013, the cenotaph was designated Grade 1 status, not only because of the brilliant bronze work by Tyson Smith, but in its depiction of the scale of loss and grief without any idealisation. We're going to have a look at the statues, and looking from left to right, we have Major General William Earl, born in Liverpool and son of the famous Earl and Langton Merchant families. It was the Earl family who financed part of the Lady Chapel in the Anglican Cathedral. He was killed attempting to relieve General Corden at Khartoum. In the middle of the steps of the hall is Benjamin Disraeli, the Earl of Beaconsfield, twice Prime Minister of Britain. He stands perhaps on a guard to the main entrance to the hall, or is he playing mine host to the ceremonies? Both statues of the Israeli and Earl are by Charles Bell Birch. The two equestrian bronze statues are of Prince Albert and Queen Victoria by Thomas Thornycroft. Four stone lines guarding the plateau were designed by Cockrell and sculptured by W.G. Nicoll in 1856. The street surface is laid with cobbles and a wonderful interlocking curls and circles that imitate the Minton tile floor inside St. George's. The area is all lit up by cast iron lamp standards with dolphin bases and there are other lamps bearing tritons and neroids. All of the above is offset by a central portico of 16 Corinthian columns, flanked on each side by a series of square unvoluted columns. Alongside the hall are panel reliefs that were added between 1882 and 1901 by Thomas Sterling Lee, C.J. Allen and Conrad Dressler. There are two themes to these panels. One was the progress of justice, and that reflected the Assize Courts, and secondly, national prosperity, reflecting Liverpool's growing wealthy status. Thomas Sterling Lee won the competition to design the progress of justice. His first two panels were as follows. Joy follows the growth of justice and was led by conscience and directed by wisdom. 
just as in her purity refuses to be diverted from the straight path by wealth and fame. Now, this sounds fairly innocuous, but Stirling Lee's finished works caused uproar amongst Liverpool's high and mighty. Why would this be? Well, some of the panels clearly showed a naked girl and a naked young woman. What a scandal. Some thought that the sales of pornography would rocket by this public display. Thomas Sterling Lee was sacked forthwith. It could appear to people of today that there were double standards in Victorian life. However, Philip Henry Rathbone, chairman of the Walker Art Gallery, son of William Rathbone V, intervened and Lee was reinstated after agreeing to suitably drape the figures in the panels that remained to be completed. The north entrance is the only part of St George's Hall that Elms would have seen before his death of consumption at the age of 33. It was left to St Charles Cockrell to finish off the building of St George's Hall. Thank you for listening to John's tours about the exterior of St George's Hall, Liverpool. In the future, we'll be doing another talk about William Brown Street. Thank you.